Okay, uh, morning. I uh, did uh, uh, <coughs> post a third assignment, and you might be wondering where are your first and second assignments, and they're with me. I'm kind of in the process of finishing upgrading. Hopefully, if not uh, uh, this week, early next week, you'll get it back. I plan to post solutions, but uh, 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 and uh, if you don't mind, I'll, if you, some of you have, uh, uh, you know, written up nice, the solutions nicely, I might just uh, use some of yours as well with my notes and et cetera. So, okay, uh, and, uh, and a few of you have asked uh, because of conflicts with other classes, uh, uh, office hours, so I really uh, encourage you to, f you know, get in touch with, email me or something and I, I can definitely spend uh, uh, some time with you to go over the topics, be it assignments or other things as well. So. Okay, so, uh, Let's see, we were uh, just starting uh, to discuss this, uh, uh, another experiment which, uh, um, or a set of experiments which uh, uh, essentially kind of, uh, kind of force you to rethink uh, uh, some of the uh, models uh, that we have developed for transport till now. Uh, essentially, uh, broadly what we have developed is what's called this uh, 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 Landauer uh, principle of uh, Landauer way of thinking about transport that uh, uh, you have uh, electrons purely look at them as waves uh, going through a crystal and if there are barriers and etc you scatter right you reflect or transmit you know tunneling and uh, normal ballistic transport right and uh, so uh, and when we uh, uh, apply, a, you know, essentially the same technique to, to these uh, extremely small systems where you have uh, single states, uh, uh, single electron states to, uh, to, to transport through, uh, and you kind of start seeing that, uh, so this is essentially what we uh, were looking at in the last class and let me try to draw it in a, in a way that's more, maybe more indicative of energies. So uh, I have a left electrode metal with a chemical potential mu L with filled electrons all the way till here, and a right electrode with mu r, and electrons filled all the way till there. And then uh, we essentially, uh, what we did in the end of last class was we introduced uh, one uh, energy state that is allowed for electrons, uh, somewhere in between here. This is, uh, these are all our energies. And uh, uh, the Fermi function of the left electrode was, uh, let's say, fl, right electrode was fr. And uh, uh, we, we kind of simplified the problem a great deal by saying that, well, we're going to again assume elastic transport, no energy loss in the channel. And then uh, uh, there will be a rate of filling from the left side, call, call it gamma L, and a rate of emptying out to the right side, call it gamma R. And uh, based on this, what we were able to do was write down the current. And the way we wrote it is, uh, 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 the um, so so essentially we uh, if you remember the uh, uh, what we said was uh, uh, I know the Fermi function of the left side I know the Fermi function of the right side but I don't know the Fermi function of what's inside right? and uh, uh, but what I do know is the current is uh, uh, the rate of electron transfer times the difference of the Fermi function right and because of current continuity you said the left current is equal to the right current, and therefore you could write down the current from this, right? And the expression we wrote was uh, Q, uh, gamma left, gamma right. W when you do that balance of left and right currents, you get this uh, uh, minus F of R, right? So, so that's, that's, that was our uh, expression in the end uh, of last class. So, so actually, uh, uh, and and uh, you can kind of uh, show it in many ways. You can pull out, ma make it look a little more quantum mechanical instead of saying rate. Uh, you can say there is a certain energy over h bar. You know? uh, so energy over h bar is a rate as well, right? Because h bar has units of energy times second. So uh, and and uh, so I think maybe on these slides I have. Uh, let me just skip to that. On the slides I have it in terms of h bar. So there is a e over h bar sitting in the front, or q over h bar sitting. In the front. Okay. Uh, now, uh, what we said was uh, uh, this essentially is trying to uh, predict or theoretically predict that uh, uh, if I kind of couple this, this single electron state very, very strongly to the left and right and I keep increasing my gamma L and gamma R, I can keep increasing my current. Rate. So 
So you can see it, I mean, this is, you can flip it around and write is one over gamma L plus one over gamma R, right? And so uh, no matter which one, I mean, so, so you can see that uh, as you increase the rate, the current should increase. Uh, but the experimental fact is that uh, uh, when people are, you know, were doing these experiments, either in a long chain molecule, where you instead of one state, you have many of them in, you know, in, 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 in space, uh, uh, or you might have uh, very few states inside. Uh, and, and we are going to develop this procedure today. Uh, the experimental result is the current really was uh, always less than equal to uh, again, this uh, Q squared by H times uh, uh, the voltage you apply, which uh, is you know, almost reminiscent of, of this uh, ballistic transport. But as you can see here, uh, this is anything but ballistic. I mean, there's really, I mean, uh, there's, it looks so different from a ballistic. It's essentially, uh, there is no, uh, it's a single particle. In a ballistic transport, we had this picture of K space, right? And you had free electrons that could move back and forth like waves. Now here you have a very interesting situation where essentially what you're doing is kind of tunneling into one state and tunneling out. So, so that's the picture here. And, uh, but it still ends up being this sort of Q square by H uh, uh, behavior, right? Now, uh, what uh, I st said in the end of last session, so how do you kind of resolve this? And the resolution is, is really uh, 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 the key attribute to this problem. Uh, uh, and it, it, it kind of makes us uh, realize uh, some very important features and one of the first features is that this energy state, which we assume to be a discrete state, a sharp energy eigenvalue, it's a very sharp energy eigenvalue, uh, will not remain so, and we will kind of physically justify why today. And then what we'll see is this, you know, will become a uh, broadened out state. It will become uh, uncertain. I mean, the, no, I, I don't want to say uncertainty, but the energy, uh, the allowed energy for the electron in this state if it was not coupled at all to the outside world, it can be completely sharp. It can be completely sharp. But the moment it's coupled, the moment I have some non-zero gamma L and gamma R, it will become like this. That, that's kind of the idea. And in terms of the energy, uh, the density of states, if you might, for, the sta uh, for this electron state was uh, a Dirac delta function, right? E minus E naught, where E naught is this energy here. Right? Center, you know, this, this energy. Right? This was the density. So you integrate over all energies, you get one because there's one state. Right? So this was the density of states. Now this becomes something like, uh, um, let me write this sum of the two rates as uh, a net gamma. Some rate, yeah. and I think you might have seen this. This will, the, the Dirac delta function here will broaden into a Lorentzian shape. You know, this, this might have seen it many times. It will broaden. And then the way it will broaden uh, is, uh, I think, uh, again, um, uh, e minus E naught over, oh, so that now, now I got to bring in gamma, right? H bar times gamma, H bar gamma, something like that. Okay? So this will essentially become something like that. One over one plus X squared, you know, something like that. Right? With suitable normalization such that you get a one, a one after you integrate the whole thing. So this is the Brett Wigner formula, or Lorentzian and all that stuff, right? So, uh, I mean, what we are doing is kind of making an a, a priori assumption right now that it becomes like this. Now. Because if I, the moment I plug this in, instead of saying that current is going through one sharp state, the moment we broaden this density of states here, then what you have to do is instead of writing a current like this, you have to write the current as now an integral over the density of, over density of states, right? Does that make sense? And, and uh, uh, the, the uh, so, so essentially the, uh, and, and then you will have F1 of E, or FL of E minus FR of E, right? And what you'll see is what's sitting out here is exactly this function now, okay? is, is when you convert it uh, from uh, the, the uh, so, so, I think, so if you, when you convert it from the single state sort of picture to a density of states, right? Uh, then your current now, uh, is written as an integral over the density of states because uh, uh, essentially what we had before was an integral over Dirac delta, which essentially just plopped in E naught everywhere here. Right? It filtered out all the E naughts, but now you actually have it energy resolved, and you have this uh, uh, h bar gamma over two pi over one plus you know energies gamma uh, gamma pi. I mean uh, I'm not trying to write that whole thing, but once you do that, you see that the, now it becomes. Uh, different function, obviously, of, of, current, uh, of voltages, right? 
and the maximum of that function, you can, this, this you can do analytically at least, uh, uh, and you'll, you can show that the maximum of that function uh, here, for example, you can, uh, at low temperatures, you can integrate this exactly. It look, you know, it's a tan inverse, you know, 1 over 1 plus x squared is tan inverse. And you can show it, its maximum value is q squared by h. You can show that, yeah. So, what is, uh, what you can see we're approaching it from a kind of a mathematical way, saying that if I were to broaden it, it will happen, uh, it will give me some consistency with what experiments show. And now what we want to do is, is really take it to, uh, to I mean, the re, uh, d develop the physical reasoning why. why. Why does it broaden? I mean, what, what, what is the reason uh, that the energy will become like that? And more importantly, what are the implications of it on transport itself? So that's what we want to do now. Uh, okay, so uh, let me... Um, is that clear? I mean, that's the procedure we're going to do. And, and whatever we do for single state, the, uh, for, we are going to first develop this idea for the single state, and then uh, immediately after that, we'll make it completely general, meaning if I have lots of states here, lots of states, lots of states, we generalize it completely. When I say lots of states here, I can replace it with a you know, full-blown semiconductor now, right? I mean, with, with many atoms or nanotubes or nanowires, but I can replace it with that. Now, right? so, and then that will take the form of, instead of just one energy level, you will have many, so therefore you will have matrices now. You have to take, take care of matrices because there will be correlations, interference, and all that. So uh, th that's, that's this, uh, uh, the non-equilibrium Green's function approach, and that's something we're going to develop based on the simple single state picture first. Okay, so, uh, and, and, and this, uh, you know, the, the, the current, and I've, I think I've asked you to kind of calculate this the current versus voltage. You can plot it after you evaluate it this way uh, at various temperatures, and you will see that, you know, I uh, over V uh, will reach uh, this, uh, uh, or rather, so, sorry, this is G, G versus V, right? G will reach a constant, and that will be uh, Q squared by H for a single spin, and then if you have two spins, it will be, uh, you know, double of that, et cetera. Okay. So let me actually uh, just step back and uh, do it, uh, uh, do the same business, but in a uh, slightly different way, because I want to set up the problem for uh, the matrix approach. Okay. And then, then we start doing the physically, uh, physical intuition, develop the physical intuition. Oh. So um, what I want to develop it now, uh, the way I want to develop it is by saying, uh, let's look at... Uh, the dynamics of this problem, not just the statics. We actually have just done that at statics till now. Let's look at the dynamics for a second. The dynamics of the problem looks like this. It says, uh, the uh, you know, if you, uh, for example, if you, uh, this is an analogous to if you have done electrical engineering, what's called the charge control model. It's very similar. The time domain analysis. So in time domain, let's say that, you know, whatever is the states inside here, I have n electrons sitting in that state at any time t of n electrons sitting in that state. And uh, the current, therefore, always becomes dn over dt. So, so that's it. Times electron charge, etc. dn by dt is rate of cha change of charge is current. Actually, we should write q, skipping that. Now, rate of change of electrons in, in this state uh, uh, is uh, equal to the rate at which this is, again, sort of a continuity equation. The rate of change of electrons here is the rate of increase minus the rate of decrease. Right? And the rate uh, of increase is, we're going to write it in this way. Uh, there's a certain rate at which the left electrode uh, is trying to fill it. Let's call it S sub 1, small s 1. You know? And small s 2 is the rate at which the right electrode is trying to fill it. And in this picture, you can see s 2 will be negative because it's kind of gone down here. If it's above there, right? So the net rise is S1 plus S2. That's, that's the rate of increase. Okay. And the rate of decrease is proportional to what is already in here. Right? And, and uh, it's proportional to whatever is in there. And, uh, uh, and it's negative. It's a rate of decrease. And I think you will agree it will be gamma 1 I'm, I'm instead of L and R, left and right, I'm just writing one and two now. Okay, so, so gamma one plus gamma two is the rate. Gamma is one over time. Right? One over, it's the rate. So, yeah. And from here, so this is a rate equation. I think you've seen it many, many times. We applied it a few times also to the uh, Schrodinger equation. So this is 
in some sense, generation, and this is recombination, loss, gain minus loss is the rate, right? And from here right away from steady state, you can see what's going to happen, right? Steady state is, is, is uh, uh, when this is zero, and then you get right away from there, n of t is s1 plus s2 over gamma 1 plus gamma 2. So that, that you get from here. And uh, I think you will uh, also realize that uh, what we had found earlier was exactly this, that f0, which is the occupation function of this, how many electrons are there in that state. Remember, we had in, in the, in a, you know, uh, uh, in the uh, steady state picture, we already found what that is. That was gamma 1 F1 plus gamma 2 F2 over gamma 1 plus gamma 2. We already found that, right? I mean, this was, uh, 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 this is a little more, it looks a little fancier, but essentially gamma left F of left, gamma right F of right over gamma left plus gamma right. So we had found that, right? Just by balancing the current, right? And so here, you actually make the connection right away that S1 is related to this and S2 is related to this. You know. So the rate at which they're filling from the left, the rate at which you're filling the states from the left, and this is actually a very important uh, thing, so is equal to Fermi function of the left, or one, times, uh, you know, how easy or how, fa how hard is it for you to fill it. You know. right. so, so that's your S1. And similarly, S2 is F2 gamma 2. And if that doesn't convince you, you can say that, well, what if, I did not even have this electrode. I had only one electrode here, right? So then, you know, there is really no F2 at all, right? And uh, there's only F1. And uh, if there's only a F1, you can see right away that uh, sooner or later, after the things have reached steady state, this energy will be filled exactly according to F1, right? Does that make sense? So, so that's, that's the ratio they take up, uh, uh, meaning, uh, um, yeah, okay, so, so is that clear? I mean, if, if the right electrode is not there, then you can see that it will, uh, this, electro, uh, this electrode will just fill it and it's game over, there's nothing else after that, right? So, okay, so now, <clears throat> and, 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 and these relations, uh, as I'm writing them, are obviously very critical because uh, these, uh, already, I mean, these are written in terms of numbers where S is a number, gamma is a number, and in this whole, uh, once we generalize it, these will just become matrices, you know, and, 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 but the equations will remain exactly similar. Okay? And so the current is dN over dt, and this N will become what we'll see as called the, you know, corresponding to the electron density, or electron number is what's called this correlation function or correlation matrix. We'll see that now. Uh, okay. So now, now, now we really kind of didn't do the dynamics here. The real dynamics is, well, if I start it off at a certain time, what happens later? You know, I mean, so, so, so that's, that's the real dynamics of the problem. And I think this sort of problem we have seen many times. You know, what is the dynamic solution for this problem? If we assume, at least assume these are constant, what will be the dynamics then? Meaning, if I fill n of t at, to a certain level and release it at t, you know, some time, how will it evolve with time? Yeah, right, so that's right. So now you see, uh, you can kind of physically make some intuition. What if that state was sitting here? Right? And somehow I have managed to fill that state. Right? Somehow I have managed to fill that state. But the electrodes are kind of doing here, sitting here. Uh, and then that state uh, has the electron there. Uh, so, so clearly, for if that's the situation, what you, what you realize from here is that, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, Fs, Essentially, that state will have to decay, right? I mean, the electron has to go out, either here, there, wherever, you know, but it, it has to lose, that state has to lose the electron, right? And then that's kind of an a, a interesting situation, and the rate at which it will lose it uh, is essentially one over, I mean, this, this is the rate, the sum of the two, right? right? So you can see that, that, you know, just from this argument and essentially a solution to this equation, uh, it will look like e to the power minus t over tau, right? It, it must decay, so it's a linear equation. So it must decay as e to the minus t by tau, where this tau is really a sum of gamma 1 plus gamma 2. So, so you see that. The sum of the rates, right? right? Instead of two contacts, if you had five contacts, then it will be gamma 1 plus gamma 2 plus every contact, right? Because every one of them will contribute to, to emptying that state out. Right? Okay, so now... Uh, you see that uh, this is uh, already a problem that cannot be handled 
within the formalism of quantum mechanics that we have dealt with, and the reason is the following. Actually, can you say, can anybody help me? So, so when I say that, uh, you know, if I have a state here and I filled it with an electron, I'm, say, I'm trying to say now that, uh, uh, you know, the fact that the electron will be lost from that state cannot be handled within the re realm of the quantum mechanics that we have developed till now. And why is that? What, what does that mean? Uh, any, any, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's right, stationary, very good point. Uh, so that's exactly right. So see, uh, he, here's the reason, here's the reason. So uh, the, you know, the quantum that we have developed till now looks like this. Uh, essentially the, the end result of the quantum, we start with, you know, d over dt of some psi is equal to, you know, your spatial Hamiltonian h psi, right? And, and by solving it, you get uh, uh, the time independent solutions, uh, which, uh, well, let's write it properly. We had the big psi, which were both space and time dependent. But then when you go to the small psi and you look at just the energy eigenvalues, it looks like this, right? These are the energy eigenvalues, right? And this state, this state is an energy eigenvalue of this, you know, whatever atom or whatever I put there, right? Atom embedded in your dielectric insulator or whatever, right? It's an, it's an energy eigenvalue of that, of that atom, for example. And uh, uh, this much we know that if I were to find what is the uh, dynamics of that wave function for that electron, uh, I know that it, it will be a stationary state with the energy, uh, let's call it, uh, yeah, okay, E over H bar T times psi of X, right? This we had developed. It's just, that's why it's called a stationary state, right? Now, uh, the, the meaning of that is that uh, if I have an electron at time t is equal to zero in that state, it will s essentially stay in that state forever, uh, and, and uh, uh, y y you cannot lose the state uh, because, well, it's a stationary state, you cannot lose, the pro you know, lose that state from there. Does that even make sense? I mean, so. and, uh, and then clearly, uh, that, that sort of picture is incapable of handling the fact that you know, this electron will go out. And it's obvious the reason it's going out is because it's really coupled to other states. Right? Right. Now, one can sol kind of resolve this uh, dilemma, uh, meaning from here you see when I do mod psi x comma t whole squared, it is not dependent on time. And that's really what we're trying to say, psi e. Oh, okay, sorry, psi e, yeah. It's not a function of time. So now, now you can see that it, 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 this doesn't even allow for anything like this to happen. There's no time evolution at all. I mean, nothing changes with time, right? So yeah, the stationary state. So now again, uh, uh, the, uh, and this problem is exactly similar to a very classical problem. And, and that problem is, uh, there are quite a few examples. Uh, uh, here's a good example. So I have an LC oscillator from you know, electrical engineer, inductor, capacitor, and a circuit. It's an LC oscillator. And I try to now uh, connect an AC source to it okay, uh, with a frequency of omega. And I try to drive that oscillator, meaning you know, connect a battery to that LC tank, and I try to pass current through it. Uh, what will happen here? Can you, does anybody know I mean? Uh, for example, you know, I'm trying to pass a current I through it, uh, I naught times e to the power I omega t. Uh, does any, I mean, what will happen here if I want to drive a current of any general frequency omega? Can I drive it? You know, that's, that's the question. Can I drive a current through the LC oscillator at any frequency I want? Uh, Right, very good point. So, uh, so if I, if I, so you see this LC oscillator has a unique oscillation frequency. The reason it's called oscillator, right? It's one over LC. It has a unique oscillator frequency, right? If the frequency of your current source is not matched with that, you can't do anything to it. It's an infinite impedance. Nothing is going to happen if your frequency is not exactly matched. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to sketch it in, 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 in a way now. So here's the response, or response meaning how much current is flowing through the circuit, let's say, right? 
uh, I, mean, I mean, and then uh, this is a qualitative picture, but I think uh, you can make it analytic very fast. I mean, quantitative and act exactly quantitative. So if you change your frequency, if you're in DC, nothing is going on, right? Uh, meaning, well, sorry, you can't push a DC current through it. That's clear, right? Uh, and you start increasing the frequency, and you still can't do anything because the impedance of that is not matched. I mean, it's just not matched, right? So you can't push, can't push till you hit exactly omega naught, and then you get a very sharp response, and, and then nothing again. This is, right? For a perfect LC oscillator. Right? But we know we can take a LC oscillator, we can drive it with a frequency that not, that's not matched. We know that. Right? Uh, and how do you do that? Because there is always a little resistance sitting here, right? A little off, right? Which causes dissipation and all that, right? In a very similar way, if you, okay, so now the moment you have a certain R, you look at the response or actually you look at the current, it will do two things. It will first shift the omega naught. It will shift the omega naught to another frequency, another center frequency, and it will broaden it. So that, those are the two things it does. So it will kind of, something like, help us later. Okay. So, so, and what I'm trying to say now is this R is the reason why you can drive what may, you know, drive uh, any sort of an oscillator circuit with a, with a very sharply well-defined energy, uh, w w w w looks like a sharply well-defined energy, at frequencies that are not matched to its oscillation frequency. That, that's the reason you can couple to it. You can drive an energy and then essentially all of the energy kind of goes in there. Now, uh, the broadening is related to R, okay? okay. And uh, what is most important is you can now see that if I turn off this oscillator, uh, turn off this source, this will not keep oscillating forever. It will damp down. And how will it damp down? I think you kind of know the frequencies look like e to the power minus, uh, you know, omega naught t. So omega naught is square root of LC times e to the minus, you know, R over, I think, 2L or L, I forget. So, so. Something like that, right? So, uh, sorry, I, omega t. So, uh, so, so this part is a complex number. So it's oscillatory. It, you know, oscillates with with, with the frequency. Uh, actually, when I write LC, this is really uh, omega prime, which is the shifted center. It oscillates at the frequency, and then this is the damping frequency, which it goes down. Right? If if you set it up at t is equal to zero, you know, you had given it, uh, set it into oscillation, and let it go, then it will kind of damp down. Right? Does that make sense? I mean, so, so, and, and, and it's, uh, uh, so you see the moment I add a resistor to this problem, it lets me decay or dissipate this, you know, and, and, and uh, lets the energy get out. Uh, in, in a very similar way, uh, you can think that if I, uh, okay, any, any questions on this? At least qualitatively it should make sense that the reason you can couple into any uh, oscillator is because there is a certain amount of broadening. Into it. I mean, if you had a perfect match, then there's no issue, but there's no such thing in real life. There's no such thing. It's always the broadening that uh, enables you to kind of couple in. And uh, now, what we can say that, uh, uh, look, uh, instead, so here, you look at it, a little, you know, if you look at it mathematically, it looks like if I have e to the power i omega t, this is omega t. This is oscillatory frequency. And uh, we can always kind of uh, do our little h bar multiplication here and write it as e, e to the power i energy over h bar t. Right? So that's the energy for your quantum uh, oscillator. Right? Sense? Yeah. And the problem here is exactly the same. You can have, you know, the reason this energy eigenstate was born was because of some, you know, Hamiltonian and et cetera. It's exactly similar as you know some LCs came together to give you some omega naught. It's the same thing. You, know, you can multiply by your h bar, and you have a sharp energy level here. So what I'm trying to say is that energy level in quantum mechanics is our e naught that we're talking about, yeah. analog, analog, analogous to that. Right? And uh, uh, you know, just because, uh, just from again from this analogy here, you can see that uh, if we uh, if we uh, sorry, what am I writing here? These are so this is omega prime t. So, so omega prime is a well-known function of R, L's, and C's. Okay? So uh, uh, just like for the uh, LC oscillator, uh, we had a, you know, uh, a term, a resistive term or a loss term that, or a broadening term that helped us uh, let it, to drive it, let, to let it decay, reach steady state, et cetera. 
exactly like that if in quantum I could introduce another term that goes like e to the power minus t by tau, then I should be able to decay it. I mean, that's pretty clear, right? If I were to uh, introduce another t by tau term in the time dynamics for this state, then it, it will decay with time. Right? Does that make sense? I mean, that's kind of very simplistic uh, thought process here. And that's exactly uh, what we're going to see is the, is the reality, meaning, you know, the moment this electron state is coupled to contacts, coupled to anything else, you have an effective one over tau there. You have an effective one over tau there. And uh, that part is missing in this equation. There is no such thing. So this equation, this Schrodinger equation in this form, what the main message we're getting is it is incomplete uh, for if we, uh, and, and let me try to be accurate here. If we consider just this electron, uh, or just this system by itself, and forget that it is coupled to the outside world, then this equation is not enough. It's not enough uh, to, uh, to uh, tell us about its dynamics, about its you know, physics at all. There's something else missing. On the other hand, if you consider this whole system as your, you know, uh, as your, you know, if you write down the Hamiltonian for the whole system, the entire system, the electron state plus all the contacts, etc., in here, then there is no problem. Does that make sense? So, so what is, what part of the system are you considering as your entire system or a Hamiltonian is very important. So uh, this equation here is an equation uh, for what we'll call a closed system. A closed system uh, uh, meaning uh, that uh, it's not coupled to any outside world and, or in other words, this is your entire system. You know, there's no physics uh, bec uh, because of its coupling to the outside world. And what I'm trying to say now is uh, this is not enough to give you the right dynamics, and therefore we must introduce something which will uh, add this sort of a decay term, which uh, 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 which will uh, you know lead to uh, rep lead to correctly capture the fact that it is coupled to the outside world through contact. That is, that does that make sense at least qualitatively? Okay, so. Now, quantitatively, again, uh, we're going to make some progress here by looking at this equation again and say that, look, what I'm trying to do again is, is take this and I'm trying to add some sort of, a, 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 you know, real uh, e to the power. This is oscillatory, right? It will never decay. Oscillate. But I want to add something which is real and uh, uh, make it e to the power minus i, you know, e over h bar t. But I want to add something else, and that's something else. You can see that if I were to write in the same way, right, some other term here, okay, so I'm going to write it in the same way, i over h bar t, but this thing must become e to the power minus a real number, it must become a real number. Therefore, whatever is sitting here must be imaginary and must be energy, units of energy, right? and, but it must be imaginary. Does that make sense? I mean, that, that, in fact, I, I would say in, in this way, uh, I'll write it in a uh, slightly different way. I'll write it as, it, I, I let me give it some real value plus some imaginary value. Okay? I'm writing this sigmas now. Okay? Actually, why, why sigma? Let's just write, uh, yeah, let's write gammas, you know, because that's what we have used there. So gamma real plus i times gamma imaginary, you know, something else. I give it some real value too, right? And that real value, will couple in with this one, right? And it will shift the central frequency, just like it, you know, shifted the central frequency of oscillation. And the part that will remain, which is the imaginary part, so let me write that down. E plus, you know, gamma R or minus, uh, yeah, plus or minus. You can, you can shift it either way you like uh, over H bar. Uh, we're doing this qualitatively now, but uh, m uh, minus, So I think it should be minus here, okay? So minus i, minus, yeah. Gamma imaginary p over h bar. Right? Does that make sense? I mean, again, just split it into a real and imaginary part. But what is crucial is it must have an imaginary part here, you know? and that will enable you to decay the state. You know? Okay. Now the, the the entire rest of the business is, you know, what, once we realize this. Uh, uh, how do you go about solving it now? I mean, so, so you know, the, the real math of it and then the detail of it. But uh, that's really the heart of the problem and how you resolve this issue. Okay? 
And uh, now physically, why will this come about? Essentially, we'll see that there are some other terms here that are missed out, you know, and we're going to introduce that. Just, and it will look just like here, you know, because n has some, you know, well, it has uh, some uh, connection with n psi star psi, right? It has some connection with psi star psi. And this thing has, uh, uh, okay, so, so the source, we'll just see how it evolves. It will look like a continuity equation after we, or, or you know, an equation very much like this when we fix this problem. So there are two more terms here. It's not the full Turing equation. And uh, just to be clear again, the whole problem arises because, you know, the fact that the electron sitting here can get out here already means that this is not my entire quantum system. There, there are other states also, right? But if I don't want to bother about the details of these other states, I want to solve the problem based on this state, then I cannot do it if I consider it completely decoupled, right? So what's the next best thing I can do? I can, I can model everything, or I can consider everything other than this system as, uh, uh, you know, something that is interacting weakly with this system, weakly with this system. And then uh, what will that do? It will broaden the state here. It will you know, introduce a, a shift and a broadening. And after that, everything stays the same. You solve the problem again with that. On the other hand, if these states interact very strongly with that state, then what you have is what's the, called the case of, uh, I mean, for example, uh, you know, for example, if my resistor is very high, resistance is very high in a RLC circuit, so you have what is called an overdamped oscillator. There's no oscillation at all. You know, so, uh, so, so if your resistance is zero and you couple in nice, you will get oscillation, right? Uh, and uh, uh, so, so overdamped will essentially just decay once. I mean, not even oscillate before even one oscillation is dead, right? And uh, underdamped is what we are talking about, where it will, you know, uh, oscillate, but it will you know, have, have uh, actually it will reach. So let's put it this way: it will reach a certain steady state with a shifted frequency and a shifted amplitude, and that's the state we are looking at right now. So that's the analogy, uh, meaning I have made my system, so the system still dictates what is the transport through, through this, it's not just the metal. If, if the metals completely dominate and you know, this system, uh, uh, or rather the electron system uh, is, is uh, you know, extremely, extremely broadened out and all that, then as if it is not there. You know, in some sense. So, so that's, that's the idea. So let me now quantitatively develop it and hopefully with the back and forth we can develop some more insights into this problem. So, uh, but that's the idea again. You know? uh, same reason why uh, you know you can still pluck a guitar string, uh, even though you're you know you're not plucking it at the frequency at which it it it, it actually has its natural oscillation frequency, right? Which is the pitch, but you can still do it, uh, and it's the same reason and and, and, and similar things. Okay. So, <clears throat> okay. So uh, you know th that's kind of the basic idea, and we'll now see how things evolve uh, uh, from this picture of uh, looking at. Uh, the, 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 the closed system and opening it up. You know? so, so opening it up to the outside world and connecting to the contacts here. So, so. And um, uh, just one more quick analogy is uh, the question that in some of you have also, also asked earlier. You know, for example, I can take a hydrogen atom uh, and I have an electron uh, in, in the, let's say it's in the ground state and uh, at t is equal to, uh, uh, what I managed to do is, uh, is I have excited it to the high, first excited state, you know, electron sitting in n is equal to two, it's sitting there. And that t is equal to, uh, and the re way I did it was I, sh you know, maybe I, I had some intense uh, optical excitation on it that matched this frequency and it, it's sitting there, right? And then you turn off the light, you can ask what will happen now, right? Because that's also a stationary state, that's, you know, n is equal to two, it's perfectly allowed ground state of the system according to this equation. It should stay there forever, right? The electron should not decay. It should not fall back and emit that photon, right? Which is the Lyman line, as you know, the first line of exit, the sharp line, right? Why does it do it? Because it's really not, even the hydrogen atom in vacuum, if there was only one hydrogen atom in the entire universe, it's still not alone in the sense that uh, it is still coupled to the electromagnetic, you know, vacuum, right? Electromagnetic spectrum is a system itself. It can accept photons, right? And so it is the contact for the hydrogen atom here in optical processes is the electromagnetic vacuum. And that's sitting at a ground state. So it, it, it prefers to pull out a photon if it's possible, and it does, right? And that's spontaneous emission. Right? And when you measure it very carefully, there is also a broadening of that line width 
you know, just like this. I mean, it's the same thing. This is a broadening. If you put the hydrogen atom inside a box, which is very small in size, matched to the wavelength of that light, you can enhance that process. I mean, so the broadening is even sharper, right? And, uh, sorry, broadening is even more. You can change the broadening. So you can change spontaneous emission by this Purcell effect, et cetera. And essentially, it's similar ideas here. I mean, it's, that because the electron state is really coupled to the outside world. Yeah. Okay, so, so that's enough uh, justification. Hopefully, uh, any quick questions before I, I move forward? Because we're going to essentially, what we're going to do now is show the uh, matrix version of all these equations and develop it in, in, uh, connected to the Schrodinger equation. Okay, okay good. So if, if there are no questions, let's look at this and uh, uh, try to justify how will we uh, try to solve this problem. Okay, so. so this has, uh, 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 the closed system has a solution um, uh, that, uh, uh, actually before I go into that, let me just spend maybe about five minutes talking about the matrix version because we're going to actually use matrix matrices now uh, where instead of say one state if I had you know five or ten to the power three states or whatever then you'll have matrices that uh, will appear we, we're going to kind of switch over from this real space wave function that we have been talking about till now into into uh, the matrix version or in other words from Schrodinger to the Heisenberg picture of quantum mechanics uh, uh, let me first write down the matrix version. The matrix version doesn't look any different. It looks, you know, the size instead of functions now have become matrices. That's all there is. Uh, this is equal to a Hamiltonian matrix. So instead of hat, I'm going to just write H, the matrix. Times psi. So that's your matrix version. I mean, that's you know, obviously not, doesn't look very big of a change. Uh, physically, what, what, are you, what are you doing? Uh, here's an example. Uh, let's say I have... Uh, uh, so so uh, so let's say I'm trying to solve the problem of of uh, uh, electron, and this is an example that we're going to use today, uh, uh, which is in a in a say a lattice, okay, uh, electron in a crystal or a lattice, let's say a one D lattice. Then uh, I can write, uh, uh, you know, so so I'm trying to write that later. So so I, I can write the uh, the time. Okay, so so the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian uh, of any electron system uh, looks like this. You know, it's the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. Let's say p squared by 2m plus v of xr. Okay. But in general, the potential that the electron sees in any lattice can also change with time. For example, if the lattice atoms are oscillating because of phonons, it can also change with time. In general, it is x comma t. Right? But we are, in our analysis now, going to treat all the time dependence of this potential, like atoms are vibrating and jiggling around, as a perturbation. We are going to say that I want to solve the problem for all atoms sitting in the ground state perfectly still, you know, which is, you can see that there's some, uh, you can question that, because even in the ground state of a hydrogen atom, it's never still, right? I mean, there's a ground state of an oscillator. But, you know, in, in the level of things we're talking about, that is fine. Uh, we, we can, let's assume for now that the time dependent part we're going to neglect for the potential itself. We're going to obviously track the time dependent part of the electrons, but for the potential we're going to neglect it. So that's your Hamiltonian. Px, you know, is an operator and all that stuff. That's your traditional Schrodinger equation Hamiltonian, right? So, you know. And uh, uh, in, in uh, so, so what are your uh, coordinates here? If you take dx by dt, dx over dt is velocity, right? Velocity is uh, 1 over h bar dE by dK. This part, you know, if, if electrons are going as waves and they have a certain k, velocity is group velocity, right? dE by dK. Right? So that's, that's the equation. And you see th th there's a nice relation between x. Uh, so the, the, these are actually, uh, okay, let me write the other equation. What if I ask what is dK over dT? The, the wave vector. How, how does the wave vector change with time? Uh, that is actually minus 1 over h bar times the force, right? The force of, on the electron. And that would look like dE over dx, which is the, you know, force. If a conduction band, for example, were changing as a potential, it will look like that. And then this is what is called, uh, uh, you know, these are So you see, there's a very interesting relation that uh, if you find the time, want to find the time rate of change of x, it's you take the energy, take a derivative with k, right? If you want to find the time rate of change of k, you take the energy, take a derivative with x, the other variable, but with a minus sign. 
So these are these two relations were realized very early on. And uh, does anybody know what are they called? Hamilton. Yeah, these are basically Hamilton's equations. This is way before quantum mechanics. This is you know uh, Rowan Hamilton, uh, uh, who showed that essentially you can derive the entire of classical mechanics based on this. And this essentially, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, you can see I'm, I'm kind of saying this not quite right. Uh, you know, there's no h bar in Hamilton. <laughs> Hamilton. So you can say it's rate of change of velocity, and then you can put mass and all that. This, you remove the k's. The quantum is what brings the h bar k. In Hamilton's equation, h bar k, there's a momentum here. That's what it is. So, so, so that, that's, and then you kind of take this, and you say that, uh, well, in classical mechanics, x comma k is the commutator, right? x k minus k x. In classical mechanics, that is zero, right? Uh, but in quantum, what you say is that's not zero; it is equal to i. Okay. So that's the commutator of x comma k. Right? That's essentially your full. Uh, with this relation, you go from classical to quantum mechanics completely. Right? So that's the idea. It's called the canonical quantization. The other approach is using Lagrange equation, which looks very similar to this. But you know, let's not bother about that right now. So. Uh, what is this, this all, why am I even saying all this stuff now is because uh, when, uh, when we uh, look at electrons moving through the crystal, we will uh, you know, have some sort of a periodic potential here, which will determine all kinds of internal forces, etc. And uh, what we want to do is set up the problem in a way that you can actually solve instead of trying to bother, or rather instead of being bogged down by what are the details of the microstructure, atomic structure and all that. We want to kind of develop it in, in that way. And we have already seen quite a few things. For example, if I have uh, electrons that, uh, let's say I want to ask, uh, uh, give me this Schrodinger equation for an electron that's going through a lattice like that, you know, which is a series of atoms. It's going through a lattice like that. And uh, I think you know from uh, traditional approaches, you will get the band structure. E the energy allowed versus k, you know, energy allowed versus k will be the band structure. If it was a completely free electron, it will be E is h square k square by 2 m naught, where m naught is the free electron mass, right? So again, just to conclude, uh, the energy versus k uh, is, is uh, uh, so the moment I know energy versus k, I know this left side completely. You know, right? And if I apply some external voltages, like with electrodes, then I'm changing the energies with, with distance, right? There's bands and all that. So I know this one too, if I know how, how that changes, electrostatics. Right? Uh, but uh, you know, once I put atoms from a free electron, I put it in a crystal, and then that will essentially deform, and we can fold things into the first balloon zone. But essentially, you always end up getting an E versus K. Right? And then that, that's what goes into this equation. And what we're going to show now is how is that thing, E versus K, uh, dealt with in a matrix version. Because analytically, you get it in a block equation and all that. You get the analytical form of it. In a matrix version, how do you get that? That's what we want to discuss now. So, uh, so uh, for, for the matrix version, what we write is H psi is E psi. We start with that. Okay? And, and uh, uh, let's say we, we want to find eigenstates. So we write H psi is equal to some eigenstates times E psi, e, psi e right? If we want to find eigenstates. Here, this is uh, an operator in, in, in the Schrodinger picture. Right? But now you can write that this eigenstate psi E is composed uh, with energy E is composed of many uh, states. It's a superposition of many states, where n is a state that is localized on this nth site. It's an orbital, for example. Let's say, say I have a series of atoms, and I've looked at s orbital here, s orbital here. No. These are all orbitals. I know the wave function of the orbital. Maybe it's e to the power minus r by r naught or a Gaussian or something like that. I know that, let's say. S orbital, p orbital, whichever, right? So n is essentially will look like, if it's a Gaussian, it will look like x minus x coordinate of n over you know, uh, two, some 2 sigma squared times some coefficient. Does it make sense? It has some functional form. I'm not very worried about what exactly it is. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, meaning when I take the n versus x. So, so this is, if I assume this to be the wave function, and this is perfectly allowed, this is called the superposition principle of any linear system, I mean, quantum mechanics, right? So you can take that as your wave function and try to see whether I can find a solution. Remember, what we're trying to do is find out what are my energies. I'm trying to find that, right? 
So what I want to show now is uh, how do you get that from the matrix version? I mean, and then because that will illustrate our next step when we take it from here to there. Uh, what do you do? You, you say that, well, uh, I write my psi like that, okay, uh, as, a, as a sum over uh, all sites, uh, eigenstates is equal to, remember the energy is a number, it's not an operator, right? It's an eigenvalue in certain EVs, right? Times sum of A, N, N, right? That's what you get, right? That's your equation. And then, uh, again, uh, you probably have seen this many times. Now, what's the next step? The next step is what takes you from a differential equation that was Schrodinger equation to the Heisenberg form, which is the matrix equation, where you take this and say that, I'm now gonna say that each of my states, n, n plus one, n plus two, right? The orbitals are spatially separated, right? I'm gonna do a little bit of a, a hand wavy, not hand wavy, but I'm gonna do some approximations now. I'm gonna say that they are spatially separated and uh, I'm going to take this state, which is you know, kind of a vector in Hilbert space, I'm going to project it on state M, you know, meaning this is some state which is located in state N, and I'm going to find another state, you know, site M that has a function associated with it. I'm going to find, I'm going to project it. And when I say project it in quantum mechanics, what you're doing is you're taking the overlap integral of the two. Right? That's the point of project. So you just project it on M, and you project it on M here. Right? And, uh, uh, what we'll say is uh, that uh, uh, this is what is called this tight binding uh, approach. Uh, what we'll say is uh, on, on the left side, you can see what we get is, you know, the Hamiltonian will just act on that state and pull out the eigenvalue of that state. So you get En times, uh, uh, what you end up getting here is, is, a, is uh, you know, this uh, matrix element of the Hamiltonian with the two M and N, and there is a An sitting in front. And on the right side, now this is the approximation. What we, there's always a tiny bit uh, uh, left, uh, you know, when, when you take projections of orbitals at different sites, but we're going to say that off-site, I mean, if I'm taking a projection of n with n plus four, n plus two, n plus one, they're all zero, except the projection with itself. That's obviously one. Right? So well, on the right side, what you get is just e, n, n, right? This is, again, a filtering uh, process of this problem. And uh, uh, what we have gotten here, An, uh, is exactly the procedure to get the answer for what is your E. Right? This is what gives you what are the energy. If you can find that now, you're done. Right? Now, you notice that this looks like a linear equation, but on the left side, you are free to choose any M you want. Right? Free to choose any M you want. But so as a result, it's not really one equation, it's a set of equations like that as you change the M, right? What is the other orbital with which you're overlapping, right? And when you take various terms here, uh, uh, I think you, 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 you realize, uh, sorry, what did I write here? Okay, so, so no. let's keep this here because that takes into account that there is energy eigenvalues. Some terms are the eigenvalues, some terms are not. You know, if, if there are cross terms, you will get uh, uh, so, so is that clear? I mean, this you might, might have seen, or might not. Okay. So, if I choose, say, you know, m is equal to uh, one and m is equal to two, and so on. Now you can see what, what will the equations be. Let me just write it for for a couple of them, okay? and, and then you see why this is becomes a matrix. Okay? So, the first one I'll write is if n is coupled to n minus one, you know, n minus two, and so on, and all the one on the right. So you have equations that look like A minus two, H minus two comma, um, sorry, uh, let me uh, write it. So, so A, N, uh, if the Hamiltonian has, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the diagonal element in some sense when both are the same, then you just get the eigenvalue of the electron if you were just sitting here, right? That's the eigenvalue. That's, that's one thing we're gonna call as A zero, okay? E zero. That's the eigenvalue if the electron was just sitting there in that atom, in that orbital, and there was no coupling at all to the outside world. You know, very similar to this problem, so no coupling. Right? That, that's your the thing. And then we say that, uh, well, there is uh, uh, the second term, which is a n minus one, right? And a n plus one, they are equivalent for my 1D lattice here. And both of them, if an electron was sitting here, and if I made two contacts, uh, two sides next to it available to it, you know, the electron can actually lower its energy by hopping from here to there. It can, it can lower its energy if it, because delocalization or spreading the wave function will always 
uh, result in a, uh, you know, the wavelength is allowed to increase. The wavelength is allowed to increase means the energy is allowed to decrease. Does that make sense? You know, if you can, because k, k is 2 pi by wavelength. If you can stretch out, you can lower your energy. Okay. So that's the idea. So then uh, I'm saying the measure of that is n minus 1 t naught, right? So, so it, it can lower its energy by t naught. That's an electron, you know, it's the hopping value, you know, hopping integral. So these are some details, uh, minus a n plus 1 t naught. And then we can say that we want to cut off all the other energies. We don't want to, we're not interested in all the other energies, meaning the electron orbital here and here are strongly coupled with nearest neighbors, but the next nearest neighbor, the second nearest neighbor, they're not coupled enough. We can cut off. Or if you want to include it, you can include it. You can include as many as you want. It's just your matrix size becomes bigger. All said and done, what this equation becomes then, it looks like this. Okay, so, so it looks like, uh, you know, what I can do is collect the coefficients here. Okay, so I can write a1, a2, a n minus 1, a n n plus 1, and, and so on, right? You have a whole collection. So I have this equation for what I'm saying, says m is equal to 1 will give me one equation, m is equal to 2, another, and so on. Okay. I have a whole series of equations with different coefficients. I collect them, you know, and, and then I write it in a matrix version. Now each element of that is uh, one of the equations, and so on. And what you have here now is, is uh, uh, so at, uh, I'm, I'm assuming at this point each site is the same and they have el electrons energy if it sits at this site is exactly E naught. So E naught, now I'll get E naught times A1, right? uh, plus, uh, in fact, let's just go over all the way to the you know, ends, okay? If the electron is sitting at the end site, its energy is E naught. And this matrix takes into account that you can actually have a coupling between, you know, the n and the n minus one states and the n and n plus one states. It takes into account that. So it will allow you to go, meaning in this row, I will have a minus t naught here and a minus t naught here as the next nearest, you know, element of the matrix. Does that make sense? Okay. And if I want to cut off the uh, thing after that, after uh, you just have zeros after that. But if you allow next nearest neighbor hopping, you have non-zeros then. Does that make sense? I mean, that's the idea now. Okay. So you have a matrix where the entire diagonal elements look like E naughts, right? not look like they are E naughts. And all the band around it, you know, the next nearest neighbor bands are all this hopping term. Right? So that's the idea. That's equal to E times this. So, so that's our equation. That's the matrix version of this equation. And, uh, and what we are after again is what is this energy, right? What, how do you find the energy eigenvalues? How do you find the band structure from the Heisenberg? This is the Heisenberg picture of that, you know, the, you have to solve an equation like this to get the allowed energies of the system, of the electron in the, in the crystal. Does that make sense? Instead of solving a differential equation, you're solving a matrix equation now, okay? And the solution to this, I think you can uh, uh, also look, so, so uh, uh, you can take maybe three rows of, uh, or actually just one row here, you can take this particular row here, right? And write it uh, as uh, uh, E naught times A n minus T naught times A n minus one minus T naught A n plus one is equal to E times A n, right? That's your real equation. And, uh, if you are able to solve this equation and find out what is this energy, you're done. I mean, you've, you've solved the problem, right? You have solved the problem, the, 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 effectively the Schrodinger equation, or you have solved the Heisenberg equation. They're the same thing. They'll yield the same thing in the end, right? And the way you, you look at this and say that uh, 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 this, instead of a differential equation, which is the Schrodinger equation, right? D2 by dx squared and all that. What you have here is a difference equation. It's this difference between sides, right? A n, A n minus one A. Hidden inside here is the fact that uh, these are really the coefficients of the wave function. And if you look at it carefully, this version, the way it's written here on the left side, is exactly equal to d2 e by dx, uh, d2 psi by dx squared. It's the same thing. You know? It's just the matrix version of it. That's all. Yeah. And and uh, here uh, you can, uh, I think we by by now obviously with the benefit of hindsight, we know what are the solutions to this. The wave functions look like block functions, right? So you can say 
uh, for a difference equation, you can say, okay, let me try a solution. And that's how you solve any differential equation or any difference equation. Let me try a solution that looks like e to the power i k x, a n is equal to, let me try that. Okay. And uh, if it works, then I'm done, right? So, so that's the idea. And when you substitute it, you see a n will be e to the power i k times x n, right? That makes sense? a n minus 1 will be e to the power i k x n minus a, right? Location of the n minus 1 site is location of x minus the lattice constant a, right? right? And location of a n plus 1 is e to the power i k x n plus a, right? I mean, that's, so you just shift the x's, right? Plus a n minus a. And you substitute it here, and you'll see all the e to the power i k x n just cancel out, right? Right? And, and what you end up getting here is that E will be uh, E naught uh, minus 2T, uh, minus T, E to the power I K A plus E to the power minus I K A, right? That, that's what you end up getting here, yeah. right? And you know energy is not, uh, energy is always real and that thing is actually cosine, right? So you get E zero minus 2T, T naught cosine of K A and that's really, your E versus K, or the band structure, right? This is just the EK diagram for you, right? And then this is a tight binding approach to the problem. Uh, what I'm trying to just show is matrix version and, you know, uh, and uh, differential equation version, really not much difference. I mean, you, you can use it, and clearly the matrix version has, uh, for at least numerical sort of evaluations, it has quite a bit of advantages for numerical e evaluations. Uh, and uh, is that clear? I mean, so, so this is, for example, how you find the band structure or in the matrix version of it. So, so just to get comfortable with the matrix version, uh, I mean, I, I think instead of five minutes, we spent about 15 minutes on this, but that's fine. So, so this is, any questions on this? So, uh, okay, so, so if I can, you can see how the Hamiltonian looks, you know. So the Hamiltonian, instead of an operator now, it has become, this is the matrix of the Hamiltonian now, right? It's kind of not very hard to see, I mean, at least here. Uh, uh, you can make some physical connection very nicely. And this, this uh, band structure, E0, uh, it, it looks like a cosine. So you, when you plot it, this is E versus K for you, right? And you naturally get that, you know, the uh, uh, band, uh, the billions of edges are at minus pi by A and pi by A. That's the periodicity of this. Okay, so from minus pi by A to pi by A. And this is for, meaning if I consider only S orbitals here, only S orbitals, say, uh, of atoms, then uh, I will get one band. So there will be a band like this corresponding to each orbital that you consider in your chemical bonding. I think in silicon, for example, you know there's not just one orbital. There is one S and three Ps, sp3, right? So you have four electrons that participate in chemical bonding with the next nearest neighbor. Therefore, you have four bands. You know? have one like that, another like that, and another like that. Right? So you have a conduction band, light hole, heavy hole, and split off bands. These are all, because there are four orbitals, each of them form one band each. Okay. So that, those are things of a solid state physics course. Now what we want to do is apply it here and look at how does it you know, help us to look at, solve this criteria, or rather this problem of, of coupling to the outside world. And uh, we want to do it as matrices. Okay, good. So I want to kind of, uh, uh, any, any questions on this now? No? Okay. So uh, let's then uh, look at, uh, uh, just, just so that we know, I mean, uh, from here you can go to very small k values at the bottom of the band, for example, and make a connection between, you know, E naughts and T naughts uh, here, the energies with the, with the curvature of the band at the bottom will be the effective mass. So you can experimentally measure it and find out what are these things. You know. So from experiments, you can probe these quantities. What are these quantities? And write your Hamiltonian based on that. So, so those are the parameters that have gone into the Hamiltonian. Right? So, so those are the things unknown. Okay. Uh, so, so now uh, what we are, uh, what we want to do is is write down the uh, full, uh, you know, develop this procedure for the matrix version, and. <coughs> I want to uh, show first what are these other terms that I was saying, where are the other terms, where do they come from in the problem of transport, right? I mean, that's, that's really the key, key attribute of this uh, uh, thing we're trying to develop now, that uh, uh, how come that 
if I had a certain number of states uh, sitting inside a channel, for example, uh, let's again look at this situation where I have a, uh, you know, a series of uh, atomic sites uh, in a crystal, maybe a nanotube or a molecule, long chain molecule or something like that. And uh, uh, let's call these sites at zero, one, two, three. You know, let's look, just look at this, this simple problem initially. And uh, the problem we're going to now look at is uh, I have an electron that is incident from the left side that's trying to go through this crystal. And then uh, if, again, the electron was sitting at any one site, it has an energy of E0, same thing as the crystal we talked about. If it sits there and doesn't move, it has an energy of E0. And if it hops between the next nearest neighbors, it lowers its energy by minus T0. Same thing. I mean, On-site energy is E0, hopping energy is minus T0. It's the same problem. And now I have an electron incident on, from the left side. And that electron, uh, uh, this problem now becomes very similar in some sense to the problem you have solved in your assignment problems where you have electron incident on a barrier. It's a very similar problem. So in, electron is incident. And uh, if it tries to go across here, then I want to write down an equation that, that actually uh, will give me not just its energy eigenvalues, but many other things now. So that's what we want to develop. Okay? So let's write this as uh, the incident part of the electron. Actually, let me draw a bigger picture for this. So 0, site 1, site 2, site 3. So I have an incident electron going to the right. This is x. And uh, let's say the amplitude of that right going is e to the power i k x plus i k x. That's very similar to what you have done before now. Right? And if the electron is incident from the left, there will be a reflected part. Right? Some of it will reflect back. And let's say that is small r e to the power minus i k x. These are the wave functions that I'm writing. Right? You see, I'm going to mix up the Schrodinger version and the matrix version to arrive at the answer now. I'm going to mix the two. Okay? These are clearly the Schrodinger picture because they're functions of x. Schrodinger picture, right? That's what you have solved till now. Right? And then I'm going to say, well, by the time it's getting out on the right side, it is going through so with sudden you know, transmission times uh, uh, actually, let's say it's going out with some e to the power uh, i k x. I don't want to write transmission because I t because I already used that symbol as minus t naught, right? So, minus t naught. So it's getting out on the right side as e to the power i k x. No. Remember, uh, you know, on the right side, if you have incidence from the left, on the right side you can only have a right going wave. There's nothing to come back from, right? That's that's the picture we're thinking about right now. And now, what I want to do is write down this uh, matrix version of Schrodinger equation, not the time dependent, but the time independent version, which looks like H psi is equal to E psi. And we just wrote that, uh, you know, for a closed system where we found the EK, right? We, the psi is just a string of coefficients, right? A1, A2, A3. And here it will be A0, A1, A2, this coefficient, right? Just a string of coefficients, yeah. Okay, so, so now uh, from this problem, what you see is uh, if it's incident on the left, and uh, so you can write down that uh, uh, I'm going to write my, you know, uh, I have this picture in mind that I have a Hamiltonian with all these rows, and columns, and all that. So on the right side, I want to write what is psi n or a n, right? So E0, a n. Remember on the right side, you have energy eigenvalue times this whole column. I'm looking at the nth value of that. Yeah. Now, what will that be? And then this is the nice uh, thing about the matrix version. You can write down by just looking at this now. So, so uh, let's see. You have the diagonal element. And what's the diagonal element of the matrix? It is if the electron was sitting on the nth side, what is the energy? That's the meaning of it, right? Instead of making it like that, let's write it in a proper way. Let's write it A1, right? For one, site one. E what is the energy, we don't know yet, times coefficient of A1 is equal to the energy if it was sitting on the site A1. That's E0. That's the on-site energy, right? But if it can hop to either A0 or to A2, it can lower its energy by T0 every time it does that, right? So that's the physical way of looking at it. Does that make sense? Energy, which we don't know, is equal to the coefficient energy, the on-site energy minus the two hopping terms, ne nearest neighbors. Right? Is that clear? Okay. 
Similarly, I can ask what is E of A2, right? Maybe you can tell me what it will be. So it will be what? E naught times what? A what? 2, right? Minus T naught times what? A1 and A3, right? That, that's so simple enough, right? I mean, so every every row has like three elements on the right side, on site and next nearest neighbor. Right? Okay, so now uh, what we want to do is is uh, uh, I want to now make the connection. Is what is it that's missing here, right? And then that's we want to make that connection now. So if uh, my whole system, you know, if my whole system that I'm interested in of the electronic or the Hamiltonian I want to write is you know, for example, this one or this one. If, if my whole system is just this, right? If my whole system is just this and there's no outside world, right? There's no outside world, then, well, in pictures now, I'm going to just divide this up. You know? Let's say this is my entire system. This is, and everything else is for me a contact. It's outside world. For example, contact zero, side zero, and side three are outside world for me now. Does that make sense? I mean, that's the dichotomy I'm doing. I'm, I'm saying that here's the system. I'm trying to push current through. This is a part of the left electrode. This is a part of the right electrode. That's, that's what I'm trying to say. And now try to write the Schrodinger equation for it. And what I'm trying to say is, the, you know, originally I would have just written this, right? And uh, uh, how does it uh, pan out? Let's write it. Okay. So, so the entire system here is two sides. Very simple, right? Right. And therefore, the Hamiltonian, or the wave function, psi, is just a collection of two numbers, you know, A1 and A2. That's it. There's nothing else. Make sense? A1 and A2. A1 and A2 is your psi. You know, this is essentially a coefficient A1 and coefficient A2. That, that's all there is. That's your wave, the vector or the, the matrix A1 and A2. And you see on the right side, you can collect these properly. You coefficient A1, A1, and then A2, A2. Sorry. Yeah. So let me write it. E naught. And then again, uh, A1 and A2, right? So I want to collect it this way. And you see, I have E0, then you have minus T0 here from there. Uh, yeah. So E times A1, this plus that, right? Then again, minus T0 times E0, right? Uh, I mean, that's trivial. I mean, it's nothing very fancy. We just, but you see that that's not, not all, right? This is now your equation E psi is equal to h psi already, right? Because if this was your entire system, right, in some sense, then your h is just that. Does that make sense? You can think of it a little more because you might find, oh, whatever, you can think of it in a circle or something like that. And that's your entire h. But you see there are other terms left out now, right? There's this term left out, and there's that term that's left out from that picture. Right? It's missing. So let's reinstate them. And in, in, in the process of reinstatement, when we reinstate it, all these other things we mentioned, you know, this broadening matrix exactly. are the same as I would have for a closed system, right? Minus T naught and T naught. And this is psi. And what was this psi? The psi was just the coefficients. So I had labeled this, I think, as 0, 1, 2, and 3. The psi is a, is a vector, which is, you know, your eigenstate, which is essentially the collection of coefficients A1 and A2. You know, A1 is the amplitude of electron wave being here, and A2 is the, the, being there. Right? So, so that was the psi, and I'm writing it as psi now. Uh, uh, but then we saw that there were other two more terms. Uh, let me just shrink it a little bit so that I fit that in here. We saw that it's energy times the eigenstate psi is equal to But then there were these two extra terms. Is what uh, and then the first term uh, was uh, minus T naught e to the power i k a. It, it could be minus i k m times two. Minus T naught e to the power i k a zero zero. Okay. What is a? A was this lattice constant, right? The distance between the atoms or the sides. That times psi plus plus something that had no psi at all. That it, this, this third thing uh, looked like this. It was A and 1 minus e to the power 2 i k a. No. 
So that's how it looked. You know, these are the, all the other terms that came about just because there are two contacts on the left and on the right. This is not the entire system. So now uh, what I'm uh, trying to really say is uh, your new Schrodinger equation, time-independent Schrodinger equation, is E psi is equal to you know, the Hamiltonian of the closed system psi plus all these other new terms. And the first term here is, uh, uh, I think we already made some sort of an anal analogy. This is what we are going to call with the symbol of you know, uh, this big S or sigma. Okay, so it's going to call a sigma uh, uh, times. Uh, so it's also a matrix. And now I'm going to start taking a little liberty and not write it as a matrix. I think you understand now this is, these are all matrices. You know? H is a matrix. E is not a matrix. E is a number. But H is a matrix. Maybe I should, uh, anyway, I don't want to put brackets around it, but just keep that in mind. So these are this uh, times psi plus whatever I have here is a, a, a column matrix. It's not a two by two. Um, we're going to call it small s here, okay? So it's a source. And I'm going to make some uh, connections to uh, uh, what, uh, uh, what are these terms now. Okay, so, okay, so uh, so this is our, uh, you know, original Hamiltonian matrix. Here's something new, and this is S. You know, so, so H, 